we launched the Kiev Independent three days after we were fired from the Kiev Post. But of course, it wasn't yet the Kiev Independent because we announced we were launching a new publication, but the name um, came a couple of weeks later. And honestly, people ask what was the hardest thing about the study, the start process, and picking the name was by far the hardest. Like, <laughs> Um, what I learned there is never involve too many people in the process <laughs> because we set up a committee to pick up the name, pick out the name, huge mistake. Um, and also there is no perfect name, but any name you will learn to live with and to love. <coughs> so we ended up with the Kiev Independent um, and we launched, uh, launched our website uh, three weeks after being fired from the Kiev Post, but we actually launched the newsletter, which was our first product, um, just one week after the firing. And the newsletter still comes out, maybe some of you are subscribed, it's called Ukraine Daily. It's a daily update about everything happening in Ukraine. And uh, we got some initial funding from an um, emergency fund for, for media. And we started, um, a membership program. We decided early on that we're gonna try to explore every ethical you know, um, opportunity to make money to fund our reporting. And one of them, one of the key ones, was to try to um, you know, get our readers to donate money to us. As opposed to having a paywall and blocking of content, we decided we want everything in the open, but we're gonna ask people to, uh, to pledge some donations to us kind of like the Guardian model. And on the surface, it was, it was great. Everybody pledged support to us. Um, you know, everybody encouraged us to go on. On the, you know, the background was not as rosy. Um, we, like almost no one was coming to the website in the beginning. At some, on some days we had, we had fewer readers on the website than the number of people who pledged donations to us. And so we had like up to 1,000 monthly um, members and less than that, like users coming to the website every day. Advertisers didn't want to talk to us. So it was a rocky start. Um, For three months, we worked very, very hard. No time off, um, just your usual startup thing. And in the background, rumors were coming about a possible invasion. Troops are massing near Ukrainian border. And first we thought it's just, you know, um, bluffing, intimidation, whatever. It was, it was incredibly, something I learned uh, through this experience is that it's incredibly hard to make yourself believe that something so unexpected can happen, even when all the signs point to the fact that it will happen. But when, when it's something so abnormal to you, your mind really shuts down and says like, no, 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 there's like, up to the last minute I thought it was not gonna happen. Um, in early February 2022, we uh, moved into our first office. A tiny office, two and a half rooms, um, but we were really happy. Our first general meeting, our first Monday meeting in the new office, was about whether Russia is going to invade Ukraine and what we're going to do. We didn't have resources to evacuate the whole staff to Western Ukraine like some companies did. So what we did, we just, you know, talked about the options we have. We asked every member of the staff to make a decision now about whether they're staying in Kyiv or staying in Ukraine but not in Kyiv or whether they want to, to leave the country if it happens. And I remember somebody saying, I'm gonna stay. And another journalist telling him, make sure you have um, Make sure you know what you're talking about because if you are a journalist in Kiev and Russia invades the city, uh, it can be a death sentence to you. 
So this was the kind of conversations we were having. And then there were lighter ones because you know you want to. It's like it's like a safety mechanism in your brain. You want to make light of things and you want to laugh about things. Like uh, one of the predicted dates of invasion was February 16th, and um, it's the birthday of uh, one of our editors, and he was like all day. He was like, "Please not today. Don't spoil my birthday," and it didn't happen on February 16th, and we laughed about that. And then, of course, the morning of February 24th came. The day before, I left the office around 3 a.m. And um, in the text right home, I uh, read that Anthony Blinken said that the invasion is going to happen uh, before, be before the start of the day. When I came home, um, the uh, Kremlin started broadcasting the address of Vladimir Putin. It was a long video, pre-recorded video address. Um, and as he's speaking, we are texting each other in our work Slack channel, um, discussing what, what we hear. And somebody says, look, it doesn't sound like this is something that's going to like that he's talking about something that's going to happen in eastern Ukraine, as we thought. Like there is not, it's not an escalation he's talking about. He's about to announce war. And as he was talking, I pre-wrote several paragraphs of um, like a news story saying, you know, with the headline, Putin announces war against Ukraine. And I had it as a draft in the admin of the website just praying that I don't have to publish it. And then, of course, he ends his, uh, his uh, uh, video address by saying, we are studying a special military operation uh, in Ukraine. Um, we published the story saying Putin announces war. And um, immediately we started hearing explosions. And all I understood is that it's coming from the sky. And I didn't know anything about how um, air attacks work at the time. Um, and the only uh, like association I had at that moment in my brain was um, you know, like the bombings of World War II, like London Blitz and things like that. And after hearing this, this hateful, hateful speech about Ukrainians and hearing that in the sky, my only conclusion was, okay, the, the road ends here. here. This is how I die. This is how we all die. Kind of anticlimactic, being killed by Russia in my own flat in Kiev. Um, but I, I guess that that's it. And at the same time, all around the city, um, other members of our team were thinking the same thing. So we started doing the only thing that we knew how to do. We opened our laptops and started writing. We were updating the Twitter feed and you know, all social media and the website with all the news we could find about what's happening. And things were happening very fast that morning because we, we heard the explosions and uh, we later learned that it was Russia attacking some key military sites and like the airfields, things like that. And uh, immediately videos started popping up of Russian troops entering Ukraine from Crimea in the south, from the north, from Belarus. And and fighting, escalating in Eastern Ukraine. So it was an invasion from all sides. So the next couple of days are kind of a blur. Um, some of the team members uh, evacuated from Kiev, some state. Um, a couple decided that uh, for their safety, they need to leave the country temporarily. And among this movement, um, we all continued to work. 
And, and we continued and we continued. And then some days later, something strange is beginning to happen. We are in this state of shock, barely sleeping, just all we do is we are writing, writing, writing. And then somebody says, did you see how many Twitter followers we have? And it turns out that we went from 30,000 on Twitter before their invasion to 1 million like a week after, and then to 2 million, and that's where we are now. Um, and same was happening with the website, and same was happening with our crowdfunding <coughs> campaign, which was suddenly through the roof. So, but we all, in those <coughs> first weeks, we all stayed completely numb to that. And then, um, journalists started calling, asking to, you know, to interview us for uh, a story about us, about the Kiev independent. And we were like, wow, okay, this is overwhelming. And then a um, couple of months later, Forbes magazine puts out their annual 30 under 30 list in Europe, and 30 out of 30 people, four are people from the Kiev Independent. And we're like, wow, <laughs> okay. And then a call comes from a journalist from uh, Time magazine, and they want to interview me for a profile, and they want me to be on the cover. I said no at first, <laughs> but then they talked me into it and uh, um, it actually happened, it was completely surreal. So a few months into the war, I raised my, ha my head from the computer, I look around and I realize, all right, we're going to make it. It looks like we are a success. And the uh, summer started and things were in Kyiv were kind of getting back to normal relatively. There was a lot of fighting happening in other parts of Ukraine, but Kyiv was kind of calm. And I was just starting to, to breathe normally <laughs> again. And then the next challenge presented itself. One of our journalists came to me and said that she has a tip for a story, uh, for an investigative story, but she needs to talk to me about it because it's kind of a risky one. So it turned out that she got information that some really bad things were happening in one of the units of Ukrainian army specifically one called International Legion, and it's a special unit formed for foreigners who want to volunteer to fight for Ukraine. And uh, it was very much advertised in the first days of the war. Uh, President Zelensky called on people to join it, and we did a story, you know, here's how to join it. And now uh, sources were telling us that there is quite a bit of misconduct mismanagement and um, some abuse by commanders and you know uh, to top it off the commander one of the commanders of the Legion is literally a former Polish gangster who is wanted in Poland um, and under criminal investigation in Ukraine as well and somehow he's in charge of like lives of the soldiers fighting so the problem with the story was, um, at the time, investigative journalism in Ukraine was kind of on pause. All investigative teams were investigating Russian war crimes. That was the whole, like, all that everybody was focusing on. No one was, I think, at the time, even thinking about investigating Ukrainian military during the full-scale invasion we had this overwhelming feeling that we are in the same boat. Um, the military are defending us, they're untouchable. 
And then there is this unit where this misconduct is happening. And we understand that if we publish this story, um, it's for the international audience. We understand that A, it can tarnish the image of Ukraine at the time when we rely on our allies' aid for weapons and funding. B, we can be labeled traitors at home. We can face bullying. We can face actual prosecution. Ukraine is under martial law now, and there, it, that gives a lot of freedom to the government when it comes to the press. And the third threat is the main antagonist of the story is literally a gangster. And he has access to a lot of weapons at the moment. And who knows whether he will want to, to go after us after, after the story. Journalists have been killed in Ukraine. It's, uh, it's not something that hasn't happened. So this was a huge, very important test for us early on to test our values. We decided that we're going to run the story. We're going to do our best possible job to, you know, to get as many sources as possible to verify everything we can. We're going to be very careful and very diligent about it, but we're going to run the story. Why? We don't believe in self-censorship. We don't think that war is an excuse for that. We think that shedding light on misconduct in Ukrainian military, even during war, is in the long run helping Ukraine. And it is patriotic. And we were ready to, to take risks for these beliefs. So we ran the story in August 2021. On the um, couple of days before the publication, I was sitting on the floor <laughs> of my kitchen um, with a printout, final printout of the story, just spread on the floor, it's like 18 pages, something like that. Um, and I was having like a bit of a panic attack because suddenly all those risks, it all just dawned on me and I was fearing for the safety of the journals who were doing the story. Um, I was fearing for the future of the Kiev Independent, for all the possible ramifications. I was crying. But we ran the story. And we ran the second part of the story three months later. The second part was another difficult decision because the second part mentioned new accusations, uh, including misappropriation of weapons, a very dangerous topic. <coughs> About three weeks ago, the story won the European Press Prize, one of the most prestigious uh, prizes that you can, awards that you can get in journalism in Europe. Um, I cried when I learned because I remembered that that evening uh, when I was sitting <laughs> on the floor of my uh, kitchen and um, you know all the all the strengths that we all needed to publish the story felt like it it kind of paid off. What we didn't see though is uh, official reaction from Ukrainian authorities from. What we know, the people who are implicated in the story are still in the international region. We're still waiting for, for that to change. Another challenge presented itself um, a bit later on, and that was a broader one and a less romantic one. So we had this early success um, the kind of success that was unheard of for Ukrainian media. But what now? We were in a very precarious moment, and we still are in this moment, I think, where we can um, make the mistake of kind of relaxing and, um, you know, saying, okay, this is this has been great, we, we are a success. Okay, great, done, check. 
but we really don't want to be like a short-lived, interesting success story. We want the Kiev independent to be there when um, the war ends and uh, you know the reconstruction of Ukraine starts. We want to cover that. And we want to be the world's window into Ukraine for many years to come. So it took some, um, I think, humility to sit down, look around, and say, OK, great, but now we have to work even more. We have to work even more to preserve what we've got, to use this to, to make this organization sustainable and make it survive this early you know, attention boost and, and, uh, and become something that's here for many, many years. And it wasn't easy because, frankly, after the first few months, this um, initial you know, boost that we got from people following the Kiev Independent and donating to us, it started to, to wind down. And that's when we had to start really working on boring things like marketing strategy and uh, you know, um, community development and, and other things like how to, to, um, to reach more people, how to retain people. And it sounds like such a boring um, thing, but it's actually not. It's actually something that we've learned to, to enjoy and we've become, um, and we've learned to do and we've managed to overturn the, the trend of like attention going down and we're actually getting, we're now growing on the, in terms of page views and we're, we have been growing for a long time in terms of um, like the number of members we, we got. We are now at 10,000 approximately and we are fighting to get more. So this slow, painful growth that came um, in like the past nine months or so, um, this is, I think, no less of a um, no less of an exciting journey than the first couple months. We are now a team of forty people. Most of them very young. Um, I'm 34, I'm one of the oldest. We still face a lot of tough challenges. One of the toughest for me, for example, is deciding when to um, authorize reporting trips to the front line for our journalists. Uh, because I have no experience as a war reporter, I never wanted to be one. And I have to make these decisions of whether to allow a certain reporter to go somewhere based on very little information. And my biggest fear is having one day to make a call to someone's family and tell them that someone they loved was killed or injured while on assignment. One for our journalists, um, I want to mention his name. One of our journals, Artur Kornienko, a wonderful culture reporter, volunteer, volunteered to join the military in the, on the first day of the war. And he is still serving. He's now in Eastern Ukraine. Um, he's been to some of the hottest fighting. <coughs> and uh, when I'm asked what's the, what the future looks like for the Kiev Independent, one of the key things in that vision of the future is Artur back in the newsroom writing about culture. I thought about how to, you know, how to add this, <laughs> this speech. And I thought I'll share just a, a few concrete lessons that I think I learned from, from this experience. Um, I wrote them down, but honestly, my handwriting is completely horrible. So 
Um, number one, being a journalist covering a war that is happening to you in your country is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because you have to stay so close to everything. You have to watch all the videos of the atrocities. You have to like read and report and edit about all of it all the time. You can't. You know, number one um, mental health advice that people give to other people in Ukraine now is turn off the news. Like, stay off the news for at least several days. We can't afford to do that. But at the same time, being a journalist in these circumstances is also kind of a blessing because it gives you a certain framework to look at those atrocities. When, um, when last year the Kyiv region was liberated and we saw what Russians did in uh, Bucha, uh, the massacre of civilians, I, the, the only thing that got me through those days was that I was looking at these pictures and looking at everything happening and thinking, how do we cover it? Like, how do we, like, do we send someone there? Uh, who to send? Um, what's the next story we do about it? And that really gives you some, some, you know, distance and some mechanism that keeps you sane through this. And also being a journalist, you have, um, you have a feeling that you are, in a way, part of the fight, that you're fighting on the good side, that you are, um, you know, that you can have some impact, that you can do something, that you're not standing aside, that you are <sighs> participating in your own way. Another lesson is that there's no perfect time. I always thought that if I was ever to launch uh, like a publication, um, then it would be in perfect conditions. I would take some time off. I would, you know, maybe I would think for a month about the perfect name for it. I would assemble a perfect team, something like that. We all were kind of pushed into <laughs> launching the Kiev Independent and it worked out. One thing I didn't mention is that when it all happened, when the Kiev Post was shut down and we started the Kiev Independent, <laughs> I was five weeks into my sabbatical. I you know, I don't, I don't like the word burnout, but I think I burnt out after 10 years in, uh, in, in uh, a weekly newspaper and I took off, took time off and I thought that I would not work for a few months and take care of my mental health and health and, and in general, just live life a bit. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, and you know what? That's all right. There is no perfect time. Um, another thing is every person is stronger than they think they are. We, um, when we started the Kiev Independent, we had a wonderful lifestyle reporter on the team, um, Daria Shojanka. She was the guru of Kiev lifestyle. She knew every restaurant, every, you know, club, every uh, fashion designer. Um, she did a wonderful job with that. And after the, uh, after the full-scale war started, she's been focusing exclusively on stories of human suffering, basically, the human stories of the war. She's talked to parents who lost their children, um, people who had their whole families killed, and she's just written some of the most painful and important stories of the war. And she's refusing to write about anything but that. She says, this is, this is how I feel um, like I'm doing my part. I would never think a couple years ago that she had it in her to, to do something like that. But she's one of those many cases where People turned out to be so strong. 
another lesson is sticking to what you believe in, sticking to your principles and standing up for them always pays off down the road. If we, um, you know, if we decided that we can obey the owner and we can like stop writing critical stories about prosecutor general, you know, not a huge deal, right? Just stay off like this one official. Um, we would stay in a safe and comfortable position, but we didn't want to. If we did that, we would never have launched the Kiev Independent, and we would never have the uh, the success that we had. We would never have this this amazing journey and adventure together. Um, I would lie if I say that I never had the urge to text the former um, the, the owner of the Kiev Post who fired us. I have the number. And I think it's a great tes testament to, to my, um, you know, patience or whatever that I never texted him, just saying, you know, hey, what's up? <laughs> Regretting any decisions. <laughs> 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 never did. Still might one day. Mm. Um, and another most important lesson that I took out of this is, and I want to share with you is, You always, always, always have a choice. When somebody tries to show you that you're powerless, you can choose not to let them. You can choose not to be shaped by external circumstances. When we were um, studying the Kiev Independent, one of my more experienced colleagues from Ukrainian journalism community told me uh, that we are behaving like children, uh, that we are naive, and we behave like, quote, we were born yesterday. And he said, this is how things are done. And he started naming other news outlets in Ukraine, good ones, he said. Don't you think that's how they do it? They also get told not to write about someone. They just go along with that. Like, don't make a fuss. Just do it. Well, we decided that we have a choice. We don't have to go along with it. If we believe that things, are, things have to be done differently, it doesn't matter that this is how everybody do does it or how most people do it. If we want to do it differently, we deserve, you know, to try. And we tried, and it paid off. Now, having said all that, um, it sometimes strikes me um, how the story of the Kiev Independent, of this whole thing, has some parallels with the story of Ukraine itself. You know, just standing up for your beliefs, um, standing up against a stronger opponent. <coughs> and succeeding against the odds. Except that except that no one was killed in building the Kiev Independent. And many of my fellow Ukrainians are um, getting killed every day for exactly these values, for Ukraine to have the right to decide its own future. I always say it, and it's not, it's not wishful thinking, it's something I truly believe. Not only believe, I know. 
I know that Ukraine is going to win this war. I don't know the price. I don't know, know when. But Ukraine is going to win. And my work now focuses on making sure that we at the Kiev Independent do the best possible job covering this amazing story of Ukraine for the world to see. And after the victory, we'll be there to cover the story of new Ukraine, of rebuilding of Ukraine into a better state. Thank you. Never, never. We we got um, only you know good feedback from the international audience and international community and funders about about doing this. Um, only praise. We got um, like off the record of the you know in the background we got some um, mm, hints that uh, people in Ukrainian military um, and government were upset with the story. Uh, there was no action taken against us. Uh, it was yet. Um, yeah, but from the international community, no, only only praise and a lot of a lot of praise from people um, from our readers, including those who were in some way affiliated with the region. And uh, I. I also feel bad about, I mentioned a couple of our reporters by name, but I never actually mentioned the authors of the story. Um, they were Anna Mironyuk, head of investigations at the Kiev Independent, and um, Alexander Hrebet, uh, a journalist who did the story with her. They did an amazing job. So just thought I need to put their names here. I don't know if this is the, the answer that you, you were hoping for, but things like techniques and tools and all that stuff, like methods of investigations, that's important, but um, I think what's most important is to instill in the young generation of journalists um, this critical, rebellious mindset of like not believing anything that anybody in authority says. And I, I say that this because I'm, I'm kind of worried about the, you know, the, some of the young journalists in Ukraine in the sense that the self-censorship that is um, present in the time of war, um, I think it's extremely dangerous. I see people not in the Kiev Independent, where we are, uh, that, that's not what we believe in, but I see people in general in the journalism community in Ukraine who are um, saying, you know, if the government tells us not to write about something, we must accept that because it's war and they know better and it's a security thing, it's, you know, it's survival of the country. Um, there are people who believe that corruption in Ukraine is something that we should shut up about uh, until the war ends. The literal thing that people say is, um, let's deal with this after the victory. Um, I think it's very important what kind of a country we are when we arrive at that victory. And um, I'm really, really extremely annoyed when journals, especially, especially young ones, believe it when somebody in authority tells them to stay off a certain story. Like this is the same people that, you know, for years were, you know, caught in corruption scandals and so on and so on. Like how do you, wh why would you just um, take something they say at face value suddenly? And uh, I think this is this, this critical mindset to you know, to distrust everything they tell you. This is something that, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I, I see it sometimes lacking in, uh, in young people, it, which is so, you know, counterintuitive, right? Like, you have to be young and rebellious and, and stuff. So I think if you can, like, 
train one thing in the young generation, or just make them stay, you know, uh, rebellious. If that makes sense. Um, I, I would say it's not about uh, uncovering something that's under investigated, but it's about like the most important thing uh, when you are a journalist who's a foreigner covering Ukraine, whether you're in Ukraine or um, outside. It's very uh, important to stay knowledgeable of the context and be very careful with um, certain things. We've actually uh, we've covered it extensively in our editorials at the Kiev Independent. We kind of um, we've been advocating for adequate coverage of Ukraine in international media. And by that I mean um, when uh, Russia blew up the, a, a dam on the river in uh, southern Ukraine a few weeks ago, the dam that they've been in control of for many, many months and that they've threatened to blow up, and that they blew up exactly when Ukraine started its counteroffensive. So when that happens, it's extremely irresponsible to write Ukraine says Russia blew the dam, Russia says Ukraine blew the, da blew the dam. That's exactly the coverage in major uh, international newspapers on the day of, the, of when it happened. Um, like I don't wanna, I don't wanna use the cliche, but you know, when one side says it's raining, the other say, side says it's not raining, it's your job to look out the window. Um, so, and actually some newspapers did a good job with that. Um, I think it was the Guardian that, when reporting about it, added the necessary context of Russia was in control of the structure. Um, Ukraine had no obvious means to, you know, to, to, to destroy it. Like it's not something that is easily destroyed like even by shelling. It's, it's an explosive that needs to be planted inside. Um, but that coverage on the, on the first day was uh, just a manifestation of how um, how the Western media sometimes, unfortunately, cover uh, the war as a sort of like a like a sports game, you know. Um, but it's, it's a huge tragedy. It's a, it's an aggressor against a victim defending himself, uh, and you can't you can't cover genocide like a baseball game. And that's unfortunately what a lot of media are doing. That's a great and a very tough question. Um, first of all, like I didn't know what to do. Um, I mean, studying, became in the editor in chief of the Kiev Independent. Um, I was 33. I, oh, or was I 32? I mean, 32. Yeah, I was 32, and I, I, I felt like I'm already, you know, um, in above my head. And then, uh, having arrived in a situation when it's uh, it's a full scale war, and uh, you have a team of people who are very young, and um, I mean they're very brave, very adventurous. They want to go everywhere, cover everything. They don't care about their personal safety. How do you you know? There is no rule book. There is no textbook um, for for doing that. So I based a lot of my decisions on my intuition and on pe putting people first. If there is, uh, if I'm in doubt, in doubt whether some assignment is um, safe enough, I'd rather not have them do it. I'd rather, you know, sacrifice potentially a good story, but not put them in additional danger. Mental health is more tricky. Um, first of all, um, a lot of stuff is Ukrainian, and in Ukraine, it's a little less common to um, to be in therapy, for example, than compared to the West. So, we started a mental health support program um, where people have access to to therapy. So far, we started just a few months, a couple months ago, and so far. Uh, People need to be persuaded to, to do that. And there is like, you know, a limit where you can't really like, you know, approach someone and say, you need to be in therapy. Um, 
that's not helpful. So I'm still learning how to like mildly encourage people to do that, including with my own example. And uh, but it's you know it's tough. I think we are not. Um, we have not yet realized how traumatized any of us are by this. I think it's going to come later on. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a one morning when uh, Russia um, sent a lot of uh, missiles against uh, at Kyiv. And it was unusual because they usually do it at night. But that was Monday morning, around 11 AM. And Monday morning, 11 AM, is when we have our weekly general meetings. So it's a hybrid meeting. We're in the, in the newsroom in Kyiv, and some people are uh, on Zoom. Hate hybrid meetings, but mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Um, and the explosions start. And it gets pretty loud. So I look around, I say, like, you know, do you guys want to? Um, like there is a shelter available, but it's like not in the building, but like a block away. And nobody wanted to go. Um, so all we did was we moved to a different room in the office where uh, there are fewer windows and continued the meeting. The meeting didn't stop. We just we brought the laptop with the, with the Zoom <laughs> on it to the different room. And everybody was laughing about it. And I looked around the room and I thought, they are amazing. They're brave. But behind this, this uh, jokes and everything, there is very likely so much trauma being accumulated that <coughs> we all will have to deal with later in our lives. So two things. To, to address the very, um, one, one of the shapes that this narrative uh, takes often is people saying that Russia was provoked into this war but by NATO expansion. They just, I mean, I can spend the next hour proving that it's false. Um, the, in, in fact, the war that Russia started provoked NATO expansion. Now Russia has a way bigger um, border with NATO than it used to be because of Finland. Um, so that, that just, that's just not true. Russia was not provoked into this war. And Russia was saying in the beginning that Ukraine somehow posed a threat to Russia. I mean, look at the map and decide whether you believe it. Um, completely false in line with uh, Russia's you know, lies about uh, America having biological labs in Ukraine where special mosquitoes are being uh, like injected with poison and sent to Russia. Like, I'm not making this up. They, they made it up. It's something that was reported on Russian TV, that Ukraine is attacking Russia with like, special mutant mosquitoes. Um, but that's just one of many things. But the more important thing there is, I think your question points to the, the very essence of this war. And the essence is, not, it's not between Ukraine and Russia. It's about deciding, for everybody in the world, deciding what kind of world order, what kind of future <coughs> we want. Do we want, you know, option one? Do we want a world where um, whoever is stronger just takes whatever they want? Where Russia can take Ukraine and after that Moldova, Georgia and uh, Kazakhstan maybe something, wh whatever they want. That's an option. Um, and then, you know, China takes Taiwan and whatever they want next and so on. Do you want the, this kind of world where there is no rule of law and there is just rule of force? Because if Russia wins, if Russia is allowed to win, then this is the first major step in that direction. Or do we want option two, which is the kind of world, the kind of civilization where there is rule of law, where there is international law, and there, is, there are borders that are respected? And you know, societies, including countries, have the right to self, you know, define their own future. So it's the it's the war not between Ukraine and Russia. It's between these two possible futures, two polar sets of values. <coughs>